Okay, all right, got my laptop. What do we need to do? Church, church online. Maybe we'll do Facebook today. No, I'm gonna do church online, okay. All right, got my Bible. Oh, hey guys. Looks like you guys are getting ready to join us for church too. Well, come on in. Let's get ready to go. My name is Crystal. We're so very glad that you're here. We know right now you've got thousands of options online of where you could be checking out church. So thanks for stopping by. It's our hope today that you'll get to engage and participate in many different ways. That you'll join with us in singing a couple songs to Jesus and about Jesus. That you'll get to hear from one of our teaching pastors a word based on the Bible, based on scriptural truths about the transformational hope that we have and who God is and who his son Jesus Christ is in our lives. Also, you'll have opportunities to pray. And of course, stop by one of our virtual chat rooms or in our comments section where you can interact with old friends and hopefully get to meet some new ones as well. But most especially, our prayer for you is that after our time together today, when you're getting ready to head out, that you will leave knowing Jesus in a more real and transformational way than you did before. That you won't leave here today not having been changed by the power and love of God. But right now we're gonna get ready to join with David and Michael in a song of worship reminding us about the truth of who God is, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So let's prepare our hearts and get ready to sing out together. Thanks so much for joining us uh, as we gather together to worship our Lord and Savior. Uh, will you take a moment and pray with me before we start our worship? Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather and praise and worship you. You're worthy to be honored in all circumstances, God. Father God, I, I pray you help us overcome the distractions of our situation and allow your Holy Spirit to flow through each of us, God. We lift our voices to you now in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who is the only way, the truth, and the life. Amen. I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. The truth, the life, 
cards. I know they used to be this weird vanilla color and then this very cool gray color and now it's all a button but please go ahead and fill it out. We miss you. We want to hear from you. Please check in. Tell us how you're doing. We would love if you have any prayer requests to come alongside and pray with you. So go ahead and make sure you do that. And if this is your first time and your first time filling out a connection card, we're going to send you something special. We have lots of things going on here at Crosspoint. We're not letting the quarantine slow us down. So please make sure you check out our Crosspoint Kids Ministry. Every day it's a new fun adventure that they have going on. And then we have things going on for high school and middle school. I do it, so fun. Make sure you check us out on Instagram and Facebook for both uh, Crosspoint Kids and for Student Ministries. And if you have not liked our Facebook page, please go ahead and do that. I feel so weird saying like us, but if you like us, you'll see all of the information. You won't have to go and look for it. And we also just wanna say thanks for giving. We know that this is a really hard season for everyone, but you guys are going strong and your giving is what keeps us going. So thanks for giving and continue to give. There'll be a give tab that pops up. Make sure you go ahead and do that. And. We are so excited to be starting off a new series and we're going to take a pause and jump into something really cool and exciting. So go ahead, grab your Bibles, grab your coffee, grab your mocha, grab your puppy, grab your kids and see what's coming up. Hey, Cross Point. It's good to see you outside today. You know, we've been sheltered in place, quarantined now for about a month or so. And then the weather, of course, has been so cold and wet and rainy. We thought it's so beautiful today. Let's do this outside today. So pull up a beach chair, get a drink or a beverage of some kind, however you want to do it. And let's just chill out and hang out here for a bit. Starting a series today called Keep Calm and Trust God. It comes from World War II times when they had a campaign in the middle of that crisis of World War II that told people keep calm and carry on. And we're starting a series today in the midst of our crisis uh, that's going on right now called Keep Calm and Trust God. Knowing that's going to be great perspective we need, we're going to look at a few stories of people from the scriptures. So finding your Bibles, uh, the book of Genesis is the first one in there. There's a tab up on the screen somewhere if you're watching or open your own paper Bible that you've got there. Um, get a note sheet out if you want to download ours or just get a piece of paper there and, and do all that. Genesis 37, the story of Joe starts this way. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. There's some good dysfunctional family stuff going on already. It's a blended family because of polygamy, not because of marriage and remarriage and divorce and all that. Uh, but he's part of that family. He's the youngster in the family. But Joseph reported to his father uh, some of the bad things his brothers were doing. So he's a little spy. He's a little, some of us might call him a little spoiled little brat. Others of us might say he's just kind of the baby of the family. Whatever the case, uh, it's just dysfunctional sibling rivalry here. 
Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. Joseph was the, the son of Rachel, and Rachel was Jacob's favorite wife. <laughs> and he loved him the best. So one day Joseph had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. The old school Bibles call it the coat of many colors. In those cultures, that would only be given to the oldest, most respected member of the family. And now Jacob has given it to the baby of the family, and his brothers hate him for it. His brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. Translated, they couldn't stand the guy. <laughs> One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. They hate this guy, and they figure out, we got to get rid of him. And uh, uh, Jacob sends Joey, boy, out to go spy on the brothers and find out what they're doing when they're out with the big, massive herds. And Joe's showing up there. Let's fast forward here to verse 18. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father, a wild animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben, who's the oldest brother, heard of this scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just no, throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. So he's going to do, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just let him die. You know, what a great older brother. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they gathered, they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern's empty. There's no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. And Joseph, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? His blood would just give us a guilty conscience. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. You know, let's not kill him. Let's not let him die. Let's get rid of him, and we can make some money on the deal. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. And the rest of the chapter tells us they staged his death. They took that coat of many colors, dipped it in blood, took it back to Dad. Oh, no, Joseph's dead. He, he freaks out. The brothers are glad. Meanwhile, verse 36 here, the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Potiphar was captain of the palace guard. That's the elite troops. They're not out in the forward staging areas. They're the ones that get to hang out in the palace and all that. Uh, skip chapter 38. You can read that on your own later. Pretty sketchy story of uh, Judah. But it says here in chapter 39, verse 1, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders. He was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. And it says that, to sum it up here for you, Potiphar put him in charge of the whole house. Gave him responsibility over everything he owned. You know, verse 6 here. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. It's all he worried about, man. He goes, this is awesome. All the responsibility. I got somebody taking care of all the work. I just kick back and hang out. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife, Mrs. Cougar, soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. He, I, I, got, I got all great here. He says, look, I'm not going to do this. He said at the end of verse 9 here, I'm not going to do this wicked thing because it would be wrong to Potiphar and it would be a sin against God. I'm not doing that. He does the right thing, even though he could totally get away with it. He, he learns to thrive 
despite his circumstances, and even when tempted to do wrong, he, he thrives despite the circumstances, but it tells us here that she keeps after him, and she keeps after him, and she gets humiliated because he keeps turning her down. So she stages a, a rape scene, and she accuses him of sexually assaulting her, and Potiphar, her husband, believes her, and look what happens to him. Potiphar, verse... Um, 30, uh, verse 19, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. But the Lord, there it is again, guys, right? But God, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. Do you see a pattern here? He goes to Potiphar's house. He's the lowest, rises to the top. He's in the prison now. He's in the prison now, and he, he rises to the top. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph, taking care of business, took care of everything. The warden has to do nothing. The Lord was with him and caused him, uh, caused everything he did to succeed. Here's Joseph. So, some lessons we can learn about what it means to, to keep calm and trust God is what Joe does here. Write this down here. He, he thrived despite his circumstances. But I want you to write it down this way. We can be like Joe and get a great pattern from his life to thrive not just despite the circumstances, but because of the circumstances. Certainly, Joseph overcame the challenging crisis that he was in twice here now with his brothers being sold as a slave and then in the prison. And he rises up and he overcomes. But I think what happens to here for Joseph is he moves from being the spoiled, entitled, soft little kid. And he has to learn some things in these trials. And he thrives not just overcoming the difficult circumstances, but because of the circumstances he's in, it does something to him. Uh, guys, in this COVID crisis we're in right now, we're certainly going to try to overcome it. But right now, we're not overcoming. We're just living in it. But instead of worrying about overcoming, what if we said, man, let's, let's, let's because of these circumstances, slow down and, and be with our families. The environment is having a chance to breathe and respond. And we can look at all the challenging difficulties of, you hear the news about people, you know, too much drugs and alcohol and stuff like now like that right now. But you know what else is on the rise like crazy right now? Church engagement and involvement and Bible sales are, are at a 20-year high. The only other time they've been at this high in this country was right after 9-11. So, man, we're learning to thrive not just despite our circumstances, but because of them. And I know stories of people, wealthy, successful people, who will tell their story of being in extreme poverty extreme physical difficulty, um, challenges of learning disabilities. And they will say, I overcame that. I learned to thrive despite my circumstances. But they will tell you, they would, if I could bring them in here today, they would tell you it was because of my circumstances. It was because I was poor. It was because I had a learning disability. And I learned some new ways of doing life and education and all that kind of stuff. And I'm successful today because of the circumstances that I had to deal with. In chapter 40, it tells us that uh, two of Pharaoh's leading officials, the cupbearer and the baker, get thrown into the prison with Joseph because he's in the king's prison. And they have these crazy weird dreams. And, and Joe knows the meaning of the dreams. And he tells them, hey, dude, you, <laughs> you're going to get hung out to dry. You're going to get killed and executed because you're guilty. Hey, you cupbearer, you're going to get restored. You're going to be found innocent and go back to the palace. And sure enough, that happens. And as the cupbearer is going back to the palace, Joe pulls him and says, hey, buddy, come here. Can you, can you help a brother out here? You know I'm not guilty. You know I got framed for this, but you're well connected there. You're there at the palace. Can you, can you help me out? Can you s s see what happens there? And at the end of ch chapter 40, it says, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. And you think, you know, if you're Joe, you're going, man, I've learned to thrive despite my circumstances. And even because of them, it's, it's changed me. It's grown me. And just when I thought I had a breakthrough, just when I thought, okay, got sold as a slave, got framed for sexual assault, this crime, 
that, God, this is just a bummer, but I rose up there, and look, here's my breakthrough moment. The cupbearer is going back to the palace. Eight. Just feels abandoned in this. Just feels like, where's God in this? And we'll be like that sometimes, won't we? I know I've been there. One okay, I believe in God, but does God know? Does God care? And and when we get to places where we wonder, has God abandoned me? Does God know? Does God care? We will just give up if we're not careful. We'll just go, screw it. I've tried it the God way. I've tried doing the right thing in my marriage, my finances. I've done everything right. Forget it. We will learn, like Joe, to keep calm and trust God by, by, hey, write this down. Never give up. Never give up. I would tell you this way, too. Maybe say it this way. Don't stop reading on chapter 37. You know, if your life is a book, you could get to chapter 37. It could be difficult and crazy and frustrating. And you're going, what's going on? Don't stop reading on chapter 37. You know what you need to do? Turn to the next page. There's new chapters coming. Don't define your life by the chapter, by the season that you're in right now. Never give up. But he gets forgotten there in prison. Two years go by and Pharaoh has these crazy dreams. He has this dream of these great, robust, like Chick-fil-A kind of cows. And then these emaciated, nasty looking, grimy, grungy cows. And the grimy, grungy cows come up out of the river and eat. The, the good cows. That's like a crazy dream. Then he has this dream of seven stalks of burly, beefy, beautiful grain. And then he's like seven emaciated, nasty, shriveled up grain stalks that come up and, and eat up the healthy grain. And Pharaoh's going freaking out. What does this mean? And all of a sudden the cupbearer goes, I know a guy. He remembers. I remember Joe in prison there. They bring Joe out of prison. And Joe tells Pharaoh what, what the dream what the dream is all about, what, what it is, that it says, hey, we're going to have seven years of a robust, thriving economy, and then we're going to have seven years where the economy is going to hit the tank. It's going to be a famine. It's going to be terrible. But he doesn't just say what. He also does so what and now what. He gives them a plan. He sees the moment of opportunity here. He says, let's set aside the surplus over the next seven years, take care of us here in the palace, take care of the country, Man, we could even take care of the region, maybe take care of the world. And Pharaoh gives Joe a promo. He promotes Joe. He becomes second in command in Egypt. Think about that. A slave kid brought in there to Potiphar, framed for a crime, rises up in a prison, forgotten in a prison, and now in a moment he has become second in command of all of Egypt. And he oversees this plan. And sure enough, those seven bad years come and they've got all this grain and stuff put aside and they can take care of the palace, take care of their country. And all of a sudden, the whole world's coming because this famine and the economy, it's a worldwide thing, maybe similar to what we're going through right now. Not just the country here and there, but the whole world is under famine. And so people start showing up. And one day, 10 men show up. <laughs> and Joseph looks across from where he's sitting up in his palace and he goes, I know those guys, they're my brothers. And the next few chapters, we don't have time to read them all today. Read them yourself. It's this fascinating thing he does. He conceals his identity, doesn't tell them who he is. He plays some games with them. He asks some questions about his family and other brothers or sisters in the family, all that stuff and more. He does all that. He even plays some head games with them where he, he uh, stashes some of the uh, palace treasure in their grain bags and then he sends the army after them and brings them all back and finally though we get to chapter 45 and he tells them he just can't stand it any longer look what it says chapter 45 Joseph could stand it no longer there were many people in the room and he said to his attendants out all of you so he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was huh. then he broke down and wept, and he wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it carried quickly to Pharaoh's palace. I'm Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless, <laughs> no duh. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of him. And I'm sure 
in a flash of time, it was like, oh, we threw him in the pit and then we sold him as a slave. And <gasps> they're freaked out. Now he's second in command in Egypt. He says, please come closer. And, and a second in command of Egypt, when he says, please, you don't, he's not asking, he's telling. So they came closer and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But, but don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years and there'll be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. I love Joe's perspective on this here. And so he, he reveals himself. He moves the whole family down to Egypt and they move in there and they, I mean, they live in the palace. Their life has just been raised significantly level. Their socioeconomic status is fantastic. And you got to figure there was some awkward conversations at the beginning. Like, is Joe just setting us up? Is, hey, hey, Joe, remember when you were a putz and you were a punk when you were a kid? But Joe, yeah, remember when you sold me as a slave here into Egypt? Probably had some fun conversations about it. But then Jacob, the dad who's down there with him, he dies. And in chapter 50, the brothers are freaked out about this going, oh, what's this going to mean for us? And they are freaked out. And look what Joseph said. It's the pinnacle of the beautiful epicenter, center of this story. Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I could punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. The old school Bible, some of you will recognize this. You meant it for evil and God meant it for good. Here's what we need to do. The third way for us to keep calm and trust God in the midst of crisis times is to ponder God's perspective in my predicament. Ponder God's perspective in my predicament. Do you see what Joe said there? I have it here in my Bible. I'm not sure the camera will see it. But right there, three times he says, oops, well, you'll see it. Look it up for yourself. <laughs> He says, it was God, it was God, it was God. You meant it for evil. You did this evil thing, but look what God did. Look what God did in the midst of all that. And I think we could debate and argue and wonder, well, did God cause this or did God allow this? This is the whole discussion of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. And those are great questions to debate and argue. The scripture teaches both of those things very clearly. Um, but I think for Joe, he would go, look, you theologians and philosophers and pastors, you can go debate all that over there. Did God cause it? Did God allow it? <laughs> look what God did. He saved me. He saved my family. He saved my country. He saved the world. Look what God did. God's perspective in our predicaments. Write this down. God is sovereign in my suffering, even when he is silent. And I think Joe, looking back at his life, had some times where he wondered, where is God? Does God know? Does God care? And God was quiet and God was silent, yet God met him there and said, yeah, look, I'm here. he knew God was there for him. It's what Romans 8, 28 says when Paul says, hey, we know that in all things, even when airplanes are flying over while we're filming, <laughs> we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Look, he doesn't say God works together in the good things, but in all things. And all things means that, hey, sometimes our stories are good and they're good stories, but sometimes the stories aren't good stories. Sometimes they are, write this down, goob stories, G-O-O-B, where God brings good out of bad. We're seeing that right now in the COVID crisis that we're in. 
with, with families growing closer together, with people setting up new rhythms and patterns, the environment getting a chance to breathe, we're slowing down. Some, good, some great things are coming out of this terrible time. This virus thing is not a good thing, but there's some goob moments. Look what God's doing. And then I was thinking this week too, some fun goob stories that aren't, weren't fun in the middle of it. I know people in our church, I'll, their names will remain anonymous, but they've shared with me that they lost people catastrophically suddenly. The people died close to them in their lives. And they look back on it and think, man, that was terrible. That was evil. That was awful. But that's where God got my attention. Look what God did. God brought good out of that evil thing. It didn't destroy me when it could have. Divorce is never a good thing. Sometimes necessary. And look, I'm not here to debate and argue and no shame or guilt and any of that for those of you who've been part of that, Ed Wendiger and other. But for children especially, it can be a difficult, challenging thing when uh, our parents go through a divorce. My sister-in-law gave me permission to share her story. Let me read it for you. She says, my parents divorced one of the hardest things ever. I always questioned why I had to go through such a difficult time in high school when they divorced. God definitely used it for, for good. It's helped me to be able to encourage and support my husband from a perspective I never would have had. And I love this. It's also helped me to be able to relate and encourage my stepdaughters in a way I never would have been able to. Divorce and death, injury and health problems. And we, there's all kinds of those things. I, I remember there's two, well, they're married with children now, but they were in my middle school and high school groups back when I did student ministry stuff. And both of these young men have suffered catastrophic kinds of injury paralyzed. One of them was in a combat thing in Iraq in 2004. Another guy had a freak accident on a motorcycle and they've talked about how it was difficult and there was suicidal thoughts and just awful, dark, dark, deep, deep, dark times that they went through. And yet they've said, both of them, not look what God did to me, but what God is doing through me. It's a beautiful thing that's happening for them right now. I think of prison situations. We got a guy in our church. You'll just see him there when we get back together again. Brandon, man, that guy is on fire for God. Uh, several years ago, his life was a mess and it was in prison where God met him and reached him. Mark Porter, Regen Church down there in Ocean Beach. We've had him speak a few times here. Um, he's shared his story about running from God in the darkest, deepest place, flat on his face on concrete at night. Jesus met him there in a prison and turned his life around and changed him. And now, not just the good that came out of bad for Mark, but all kinds of people down there in Ocean Beach who are being reached because of the good that came out of the bad. Another great goob story. Look what God did. Another story I got this week from a guy who knows somebody whose parent, whose mom was killed by a drunk driver. And look, I know it's a challenging thing for us. We have experience with that, but Listen to what he says. He said, I had a friend a few years back who had the awful task of cleaning out his parents' car at a tow lot after a drunk driver killed his mom and put his dad in ICU. While he was there between the two cars, his parents' car and his own car, the other driver arrived, not the drunk driver guy, but the other car that was involved in the accident. And he led him to the Lord right there between those two cars. Look what God did. Look, people getting killed by a drunk driver, that's not a good thing. That's awful. But God says, I'll work in all things to accomplish great things. Ministries and impact get started. And I have so many stories. The one that rings closest to home here for us at Crosspoint comes from Courtney Atnip in Vivian's Hope. She was in Uganda several years ago and um, saw a little orphan little girl there. I think she was just a, a few years old and she was decimated with disease and sickness and malnourished. And they tried to, to bring her back, but they just couldn't. And eventually little Vivian died. And that's not just a, a statistic. That's, that's a real person there. But Courtney was so moved by that that her and her friend Kelly Falk got together and they started a ministry called <laughs> Vivian's Hope. And as a result of Vivian's Hope now, Vivian dying was not a good thing. But as a result of that, the good that came out of that that what was meant for evil now has meant that hundreds of children now 
are receiving medical care, being rescued and fed and educated there over there in Uganda in ways that never would have happened before. I would be curious what your goob story is. Tell us about it at Go to Cross Point on Facebook and Instagram. We'd love to hear what your story is. We can keep calm and trust God by just following this great pattern that Joseph puts out there for us today to thrive despite and because of our circumstances, to, to never quit, to never give up. We're just in the middle of the story right now. And then to keep God's perspective in, our, in mind in our predicaments, to, that God is sovereign in my suffering even when he is silent. And of course, the best example of, of this for us is not Joseph, but Jesus. Joseph is the, the foreshadowing, the, the hinting, the small little type of this. Jesus is the one that 2,000 years ago hangs on a cross, abandoned by his friends and followers at the most evil place in the world, a cross that is horrendous and despicable and evil. And he screams out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you know what he hears back? Nothing. That was an evil, the most evil day in the history of humanity. But Jesus goes through it and three days later rises from the dead. It's the ultimate goob story. What God did to bring good out of bad. That what we did and perpetrated for evil, God used for good and turned that cross not into a disgusting, evil thing, but, but a, 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 an el, a emblem of, of faith in Jesus, of what it means, what he did to save the world. We're going to sing together right now in just a bit. David and Michael are going to be here and going to lead us again in some great songs about our great hero, Jesus, who brings good out of bad. Like we've told you already, click on those links there and fill out that connection card. The connection card helps us stay connected with you. Helps us know that you were here, actually. Helps us, you know, you can share your goob story there. You can share a prayer request there. You can uh, do whatever you want there, but let us know about that. Click on the live prayer thing today for prayer if you need prayer about anything here in these remaining few moments. So excited and stoked, too. One of the best ways you can, we can um, keep calm and trust God in these economic times that are a little difficult is to keep giving to God off the top. And I know income ebbs and flows right now, but one of the best things you can do is what you're already doing. So I hardly even need to tell you about this. I just need to encourage you, do what you're doing and keep doing it as you learn to trust God and keep calm, even in this financial crisis. David, Michael, take it away. Would you open the heavens? And Lord, come and make all things new. And I will keep watching and praying as my soul longs only for you. So I'm gathering wood for the fire.
I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for Take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord for the battle belongs to you Lord before we conclude our, uh, our worship service with our last song uh, I'd like to read uh, out of scripture uh, Peter addressing the church in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness 
tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ. boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of kings calls me his own Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on We believe that Jesus Christ is our living hope, that God is active and he is moving even during these strange and difficult times. And we each have one of those goob stories, good out of bad. Whether it's been something that God has done in our lives in the past or something that we're praying for him to do right now. So hit us up with those goob stories, send those out to us on our social media or email us. We would love to share those with everybody. Before you head out today, don't forget to fill out that connection card. Our host will pop that 
in the chat one more time so you can find that link or look around on the platform that you're on and please connect with us. Please let us know your prayer requests. Please fill out that connection card before you head out today. We're gonna see you all throughout the week on our various virtual platforms. Maybe that's through a virtual small group. Maybe that's through Pastor Tim's Take Two Daily Devotional Moments, all of our high school resources, and of course, on all of our social media platforms where you can be connecting with us throughout the week. Before you go, we encourage you to say hi, stick around in our virtual plaza, chat with us a little bit more, let's hang out. We only have one rule here at Cross Point, and that's before you go, make sure you say hi to somebody. Don't just hang out with your friends, but reach out to everybody else again. Maybe say hi to an old friend, but meet some new ones too, all right? Guys, we pray that you have an awesome, blessed, just tremendous, fabulous week until we see you here again.